Part 4 of Acres of Diamonds This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Acres of Diamonds by Russell H. Conwell, Part 4 True greatness is often unrecognized, that is sure. You do not know anything about the greatest men and women. I went out to write the life of General Garfield, and a neighbor, knowing I was in a hurry, and as there was a great crowd around the front door, took me around to General Garfield's back door and shouted, Jim, Jim. And very soon Jim came to the door and let me in, and I wrote the biography of one of the grandest men of the nation. And yet he was just the same old Jim to his neighbor. If you know a great man in Philadelphia and you should meet him tomorrow, you would say, How are you, Sam? Or, Good morning, Jim. Of course you would. That is just what you would do. One of my soldiers in the Civil War had been sentenced to death, and I went up to the White House in Washington, sent there for the first time in my life to see the president. I went into the waiting room and sat down with a lot of others on the benches, and the secretary asked one after another to tell him what they wanted. After the secretary had been through the line, he went in and then came back to the door and motioned for me. I went up to that ante room, and the secretary said, That is the president's door right over there. Just rap on it and go right in. I never was so taken aback, friends, in all my life, never. The secretary himself made it worse for me because he had told me how to go in and then went out the other door on the left and shut that. And there I was, in the hallway, by myself, before the President of the United States of America's door. I had been on fields of battle where the shells did sometimes shriek and the bullets did sometimes hit me, but I always wanted to run. I have no sympathy with the old man who says I would just as soon march up to the cannon's mouth as eat my dinner. And I have no faith in a man who doesn't know enough to be afraid when he's being shot at. I never was so afraid when the shells came around us at Antietam as I was, when I went to that room that day, but I finally mustered the courage, I don't know how I ever did, and at arm's length tapped on the door. The man inside did not help me at all, but yelled out, Come in and sit down. Well, I went in and sat down on the edge of a chair and wished I were in Europe, and the man at the table did not look up. He was one of the world's greatest men, and was made great by one single rule. Oh, that all the young people of Philadelphia were before me now, and I could say just this one thing, and that they would remember it. I would give a lifetime for the effect it would have on our city and on, on civilization. Abraham Lincoln's principle for greatness can be adopted by nearly all. This was his rule. Whatsoever he had to do at all, he put his whole mind into it and held it all there until that was all done. That makes men great almost anywhere. He stuck to those papers at the table and did not look up at me, and I sat there trembling. Finally, when he had put the string around his papers, he pushed them over to one side and looked over to me, and a smile came over his worn face, and he said, I'm a very busy man, and have only a few minutes to spare. Now tell me in the fewest words what it is you want. I began to tell him and mention the case, and he said, I have heard all about it, and you do not need to say any more. Mr. Stanton was talking to me only a few days ago about that, you can go to the hotel and rest assured that the president never did sign an order to shoot a boy under 20 years of age, and never will. You can say that to his mother, anyhow. And then he said to me, 
how is it going in the field? I said, we sometimes get discouraged. And he said, it is all right. We are getting very near the light. No man ought to wish to be president of the United States. And I will be glad when I get through. Then Tad and I are going out to Springfield, Illinois. I have bought a farm out there, and I don't care if I again earn only 25 cents a day. Tad has a mule team, and we're going to plant onions. Then he asked me, were you brought up on a farm? I said, yes, in the Berkshire Hills of Massachusetts. He then threw his leg over the corner of the big chair and said, I have heard many a time ever since I was young that up there in those hills you have to sharpen the noses of the sheep in order to get down to the grass between the rocks. He was so familiar, so, so every day, so farmer-like, that I felt right at home with him at once. He then took hold of another roll of paper and looked up at me and said, Good morning. I took the hint then and got up and went out. After I'd gotten out, I could not realize I had seen the President of the United States at all. But a few days later, when still in the city, I saw the crowd pass through the East Room by the coffin of Abraham Lincoln. And when I looked at the upturned face of the murdered President, I felt then that the man I had seen such a short time before, who, so simple a man, so plain a man, was one of the greatest men that God ever raised up to lead a nation on to ultimate liberty. Yet he was only old Abe to his neighbors. When they had the second funeral, I was invited, among others, and went out to see that same coffin put back in the tomb at Springfield. Around the tomb stood Lincoln's old neighbors, to whom he was just old Abe. Of course, that was all they would say. Did you ever see a man who struts around altogether too large to notice an ordinary working mechanic? Do you think he is great? He's nothing but a puffed-up balloon held down by his big feet. There is no greatness there. Who are the great men and women? My attention was called the other day to the history of a very little thing that made the fortune of a very poor man. It was an awful thing, and yet because of that experience, he, not a great inventor or genius, invented the pin that is now called the safety pin, and out of that safety pin made the fortune of one of the great aristocratic families of this nation. A poor man in Massachusetts who had worked in the nail works was injured at 38, and he could earn but little money. He was employed in the office to rub out the marks on the bills made by pencil memorandums, and he used a rubber until his hand grew tired. He then tied a piece of rubber on the end of a stick and worked it like a plane. His little girl came and said, Why, you have a patent, haven't you? The father said afterward, My daughter told me when I took that stick and put the rubber on the end, that there was a patent, and that was the first thought of that. He went to Boston and applied for his patent, and every one of you that has a rubber-tipped pencil in your pocket is now paying tribute to the millionaire. No capital, not a penny did he invest in it. All was income all the way up into the millions. But let me hasten to one other greater thought. Show me the great men and women who live in Philadelphia. A gentleman over there will get up and say, we don't have any great men in Philadelphia. They don't live here. They live away off in Rome or St. Petersburg or London or Maniunk or anywhere else but here in our town. I have come now to the apex of my thought. I have come now to the heart of the whole matter and to the center of my struggle. Why isn't Philadelphia a greater city in its greater wealth? Why does New York excel Philadelphia, people say, because of her harbor? Why do many other cities of the United States get ahead of Philadelphia now? There's only one answer, and that is because our own people talk down their own city. 
If there ever was a community on earth that has to be forced ahead, it's the city of Philadelphia. If we were to have a boulevard, talk it down. If we are going to have better schools, talk them down. If you wish to have wise legislation, talk it down. Talk all the proposed improvements down. That is the only great wrong that I can lay at the feet of the magnificent Philadelphia that has been so universally kind to me. I say it's time we turn around in our city and begin to talk up the things that are in our city and begin to set them before the world as the people of Chicago, New York, St. Louis, and San Francisco do. Oh, if we could only get that spirit out among our people that we can do things in Philadelphia and do them well. Arise, ye millions of Philadelphians, trust in God and man, and believe in the great opportunities that are right here, not over in New York or Boston, but here, for business, for everything that is worth living for on earth. There never was an opportunity greater. Let us talk up our own city. But there are two other young men here tonight, and that is all I will venture to say because it is too late. One over there gets up and says, there's going to be a great man in Philadelphia, but never was one. Oh, is that so? When are you going to be great? When I am elected to some political office. Young man, won't you learn a lesson in the primer of politics that is a prima facie evidence of littleness to hold office under our form of government? Great men get into office sometimes, but what this country needs is men that will do what we tell them to do. This nation, where the people rule, is governed by the people for the people. And so long as it is, then the office holder is but the servant of the people. And the Bible says, the servant cannot be greater than the master. The Bible says, he that is sent cannot be greater than him who sent him. The people rule, or should rule, and if they do, we do not need the greater men in office. If the great men in America took our offices, we would change to an empire in the next ten years. I know of a great many young women, now that women's suffrage is coming, who say, I'm going to be president of the United States someday. I believe in women's suffrage, and there is no doubt but what it is coming. And I'm getting out of the way anyhow. I may want an office by and by myself. But if the ambition for an office influences the women in their desire to vote, I want to say right here, what I say to the young men, that if you only get the privilege of casting one vote, you don't get anything that's worthwhile. Unless you can control more than one vote, you will be unknown and your influence so dissipated as practically not to be felt. This country is not run by votes. Do you think it is? It is governed by influence. It is governed by the ambitious and the enterprises which control votes. The young woman that thinks she is going to vote for the sake of holding an office is making an awful blunder. That other young man gets up and says, There are going to be great men in this country and in Philadelphia. Oh, is that so? When? When there comes a great war, when we get into difficulty through watchful waiting in Mexico, when we get into war with England over some frivolous deed, or with Japan, or China, or New Jersey, or some distant country. Then I will march up to the cannon's mouth. I will sweep up among the glistening bayonets. I will leap into the arena and tear down the flag and bear it away in triumph. I will come home with stars on my shoulder and hold every office in the gift of the nation and I will be great. No, you won't. You think you're going to be made great by an office. But remember that if you are not great before you get the office, you won't be great when you secure it. It will only be a burlesque in that shape. 
We had a peace jubilee here after the Spanish War. Out west, they don't believe this, because they said Philadelphia would not have heard of any Spanish War until 50 years hence. Some of you saw the procession go up Broad Street. I was away, but the family wrote to me that the tally-ho coach with Lieutenant Hobson upon it stopped right in front of the door, and people shouted, Hurrah for Hobson! And if I had been there, I would have yelled too, because he deserves much more of his country than he's ever received. But suppose I go into school and say, Who sunk the Merrimack at Santiago? And if the boys answer me, Hobson, they will tell me seven-eighths of a lie. There were seven other heroes on that steamer, and they, by virtue of their position, were continually exposed to Spanish fire, while Hobson, as an officer, might reasonably be behind the smokestack. You have gathered in this house your most intelligent people, and yet, perhaps, not one here could name the other seven men. We ought not to so teach history. We ought to teach that, however humble a man's station may be, if he does his full duty in that place, he is just as much entitled to the American people's honor as is the king upon his throne. But we do not so teach. We are now teaching everywhere that the generals do all the fighting. I remember that after the war, I went down to see General Robert E. Lee, that magnificent Christian gentleman of whom both North and South are now proud as one of our great Americans. The general told me about his servant, Rastus, who was an enlisted colored soldier. He called him in one day to make fun of him and said, Rastus, I hear that all the rest of your company are killed, and why are you not killed? Rastus winked at him and said, because when there's any fighting going on, I stay back with the generals. I remember another illustration. I would leave it out, but for the fact that when you go to the library to read this lecture, you will find this has been printed in it for 25 years. I shut my eyes, shut them close, and lo, I see the faces of my youth. And yes, sometimes they say to me, your hair is not white. You're working night and day without seeming ever to stop. You can't be old. But when I shut my eyes, like any other man of my years, oh, then come trooping back the faces of the loved and lost of long ago, and I know, whatever men may say, it is evening time. I shut my eyes now and look back to my native town in Massachusetts, and I see the cattle showground on the mountain top. I can see the horse sheds there. I can see the Congregational Church, see the Town Hall and the Mountaineers' Cottages, see a great assembly of people turning out, dressed resplendently, and I can see flags flying and handkerchiefs waving and hear bands playing. I can see that company of soldiers that had re-enlisted, marching up on that cattle showground. I was but a boy, but I was captain of that company and puffed out with pride. A cambric needle would have burst me all to pieces. Then I thought it was the greatest event that ever came to man on earth. If you have ever thought you would like to be a king or queen, you go and be received by the mayor. The bands played and the people turned out to receive us. I marched up that common so proud at the head of my troops and we turned down into the town hall. Then they seated my soldiers down the center aisle, and I sat down on the front seat. A great assembly of people, a hundred or two, came in to fill the town hall so that they stood up all around. Then the town officers came in and formed a half circle. The mayor of the town sat in the middle of the platform. He was a man who had never held office before, but he was a good man. And his friends have told me that I might use this without giving them offense. He was a good man, but he thought an office made a man great. He came up, took his seat, adjusted his powerful spectacles, and looked around. 
when he suddenly spied me sitting there on the front seat. He came right forward on the platform and invited me up to sit with the town officers. No town officer ever took any notice of me before I went to war, except to advise the teacher to thrash me. And now I was invited up on the stand with the town officers. Oh, my, the town mayor was then the emperor, the king of our day and our time. As I came up on the platform, they gave me a chair about this far, I would say, from the front. When I had got seated, the chairman of the selectmen rose and came forward to the table, and we all supposed he would introduce the congregational minister, who was the only orator in town, and that he would give the oration to the returning soldiers. But, friends, you should have seen the surprise which ran over the audience when they discovered that the old fellow was going to deliver that speech himself. He had never made a speech in his life, but he fell into the same error that hundreds of other men have fallen into. It seems so strange that a man won't learn he must speak his piece as a boy if he intends to be an orator when he is grown. But he seems to think all he has to do is hold an office to be a great orator. So he came up to the front and brought with him a speech which he had learned by heart, walking up and down the pasture where he had frightened the cattle. He brought the manuscript with him, spread it out on the table so as to be sure he might see it. He adjusted his spectacles and leaned over it for a moment and marched back on the platform, and then came forward like this, tramp, tramp, tramp. He must have studied the subject a great deal, when you come to think of it, because he assumed an elocutionary attitude. He rested heavily on his left heel, threw back his shoulders, slightly advanced the right foot, opened the organs of speech, and advanced his right foot at an angle of 45. As he stood in that elocutionary attitude, friends, this is the way that speech went. Now, some people say to me, don't you exaggerate? That would be impossible. But I am here for the lesson and not for the story. And this is the way it went. Fellow citizens. As soon as he heard his voice, his fingers began to go like that. His knees began to shake. And then he trembled all over. He choked and swallowed and came around to the table to look at the manuscript. Then he gathered himself up with clenched fists and came back. Fellow citizens, fellow citizens, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are very happy. We are very happy. We are very happy. We are very happy to welcome back to their native town these soldiers who have fought and bled and come back again to their native town. We are especially, we are especially, we are especially, we are especially pleased to see with us today this young hero, that meant me, this young hero who in imagination, friends, remember he said that. If he had not said in imagination, I would not be egotistic enough to refer to it at all. This young hero, who in imagination we have seen leading, we have seen leading, leading, we have seen leading his troops onto the deadly breach. We have seen his shining, we have seen his shining, his shining, his shining sword flashing, flashing in the sunlight as he shouted to his troops, come on. Oh, dear, 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 how little that good man knew about war. If he had known anything about war at all, he ought to have known what any of my G.A.R. comrades here tonight will tell you is true, that it is next to a crime for an officer of infantry ever in time of danger to go ahead of his men. I, with my shining sword flashing in the sunlight, shouting to my troops, come on. I never did it. Do you suppose I would get in front of my men to be shot in front by the enemy and in the back by my own men? That is no place for an officer. 
The place of the officer in actual battle is behind the line. How often, as a staff officer, I rode down the line when our men were suddenly called to the line of battle, and the rebel yells were coming out of the woods and shouted, Officers to the rear! Officers to the rear! Then every officer gets behind the line of private soldiers, and the higher the officer's rank, the farther behind he goes. Not because he is any the less brave, but because the laws of war require that. And yet he shouted, I with my shining sword. In that house there sat the company of my soldiers, who had carried that boy across the Carolina rivers that he might not wet his feet. Some of them had gone far out to get a pig or a chicken, and some of them had gone to death under the shell-swept pines in the mountains of Tennessee. Yet in the good man's speech they were scarcely known. He did refer to them, but only incidentally. The hero of the hour was this boy, did the nation owe him anything? No, nothing then, nothing now. Why was he the hero? Simply because that man fell into the same human error, that this boy was great because he was an officer, and these were only private soldiers. Oh, I learned the lesson then that I will never forget, so long as the tongue of the bell of time continues to swing for me. Greatness consists not in the holding of some future office, but really consists in doing great deeds with little means and the accomplishment of vast purposes from the private ranks of life. To be great at all, one must be great here, now, in Philadelphia. He who can give to this city better streets and better sidewalks, better schools and more colleges, more happiness and more civilization, more of God. He will be great anywhere. Let every man or woman here, if you never hear me again, remember this, that if you wish to be great at all, you must begin where you are and what you are in Philadelphia now. He that can give to his city any blessing, he who can be a good citizen while he lives here, he that can make better homes, he that can be a blessing, whether he works in the shop or sits behind the counter or keeps house, whatever be his life, he who would be great anywhere must first be great in his own Philadelphia. End of Part 4